Good morning. I'm Michelle DePass, and I'm the Dean of the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy. And I'm also the director of the Tishman Environment and Design Center, uh, which is sponsoring this fantastic celebration, Earth Matters, Designing Our Future. Throughout the day, we're hosting panels and discussions on climate action and sustainability, spanning the disciplines. This morning, we're kicking off our day with our special panel event, Exploring Sustainable Fashion. As you can see in today's range of programming, TEDC uses the power of interdisciplinary collaboration to confront one of the most important issues of our time, climate change. Over the past year, we've convened faculty from the New School, Parsons, Lang, Manus, NSPE, and NSSR to continue our mission of integrating bold design, policy, and social justice approaches to environmental issues. I'm excited to introduce one of TEDC's affiliated faculty this morning, Dr. Timo Rissanen. Timo Rissanen is the Assistant Professor of Fashion Design and Sustainability, as well as the Program Director of the Associate in Applied Science Fashion Design and Fashion Marketing in the School of Fashion at Parsons. He holds a PhD in design from University of Technology, Sydney. His thesis focused on zero waste fashion design. Having lived in Finland, Spain, Australia, and the US, Timo's interested in local perspectives to global challenges in fashion and design. In 2011, he co-edited Shaping Sustainable Fashion with Alison Gwilt, and his next book with Holly McQuillan on zero waste fashion design is published by Bloomsbury later in 2015. Sustainability research is at the core of Timo's design practice, and his work is exhibited internationally. And I know for a fact that his friends call him Dr. Fashion. So I want to welcome Dr. Timo Rissanen, who will take you through this morning's events. Timo. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you all for coming. Um, I know that it's about three weeks away from finals, so um, I really appreciate everybody being here at 10 a.m. On a, on a Wednesday morning. So um, happy Earth Day to everyone, and, and thank you once more. Um, I also really want to thank the three panelists that are here with, um, here with us today. Um, and, um, and I'm really excited and uh, privileged to to. Uh, lead the discussion, and um, I'm going to start by introducing uh, each of the three. Um, I do have a bit of a cheat sheet, so um, um, bear with me. Um, so I'm going to start um, with Nicole Wilson. Um, Nicole is the Director of Corporate Responsibility at Tommy Hilfiger North America. And in that role, Nicole leads the newly created Corporate Responsibility Team in making sustainability an integrated part of, um, of what Tommy Hilfiger does. From liaising with supply chain personnel to communicating with external sustainability groups and stakeholders, Nicole is the voice of sustainability at Tommy Hilfiger North America. And um, prior to joining Tommy Hilfiger, Nicole was the manager of um, supply sustainability at, at the Walt Disney Company, where she worked for over six years. Nicole is currently pursuing a master's degree from Harvard University in sustainability and environmental management, and also holds an MBA from Franklin University, as well as a bachelor's degree from the Ohio State University. So, Nicole, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, next, I have Pascal Gassen, um, uh, a friend of many years. Um, Pascal is an artist, an educator, and a fashion designer based here in New York. Within her art and design practice, Gassen produces and facilitates large collaborative projects using clothing as her main medium. The focus, both of her teaching and her artistic practice, is on the relational aspects of fashion and on developing reciprocal models of production and exchange. She's an associate professor of fashion um, in the School of Design Strategies here at Parsons, where she has developed and implemented an alternative fashion curriculum within the BFA Integrated Design Program. She's currently involved in establishing a worker cooperative for local textile production in the Hudson Valley. Again, thank you so much, Pascal, for 
being with us today. And then um, I want to introduce Liz Spencer. Liz Spencer lives in gardens and dies in Brooklyn here in New York. And her business is called The Dogwood Dyer, um, which imparts color onto cloth for sustainable fashion and home goods uh, designers using only plant and mineral based, based sources. Her pigment comes from Brooklyn grown and regionally foraged plants as well as ethically sourced dye stuffs. Um, care is taken to reduce water use in the dyeing process and a significant portion of the refused water is recycled back to feed her urban sidewalk dye garden planters. As an advocate for considerate design implementation and education, Liz teaches sustainability, fashion, textiles and natural dyeing at Parsons and at FIT. She is a Venture Fellow at the Brooklyn Fashion and Design Accelerator and holds a BA from Linfield College and an MA in Sustainable Fashion from the London College of Fashion. Um, and um, I've had the privilege to work with Liz over the past year. She's been teaching in the BFA program as well as the first year course, Sustainable Systems, in, uh, that all Parsons Bachelor students take. And um, also a number of my students have worked with Liz directly um, on having their fabrics naturally dyed. So, um, again, it's a privilege to have you here, and thank you very much. And um, I have questions for each of the panelists. Some of, some of them are directed at each of the panelists individually, and some of them are directed at um, the entire panel. And then, um, before we finish today, uh, we will open it up to questions to all of you and, um, and try and make sure that all of you have an opportunity to um, have any questions that you may have answered. So I'm going to kick off with, um, with Nicole and, and the work that you do at Tommy Hilfiger. So can you tell us a little bit about what your work actually entails? Because the, kinds of role, the kind of role that you have, um, they're fairly new roles in the industry. Like if you look back 10 years, 15 years ago, those kinds of roles didn't really actually exist. So if you could tell us a little bit about what your work actually entails. Certainly. Uh, so again, thank you for having me. Um, the work that I do with Tommy, my role is basically that I'm responsible for making sure that we are a good corporate citizen, right? And then you say, well, what does that mean? That we are acknowledging all the laws, regulations, uh, the trends, of course, although I'm not responsible for any kind of fashion, which is a good thing, right? I'm not really the most fashionable individual. But <laughs> in terms of being responsive and having the visibility, right, to what's going on in the world, we know that we consume goods, we know that we produce items, so it's our responsibility to be involved in how that takes place. To acknowledge, to participate in the discussion on how we can improve those conditions. So when you think about human rights, so I have everything from human rights, uh, environmental chemicals, so on and so forth, everything with the exception of any of our philanthropic efforts. So I'm responsible for having those communications with groups like the ZDHC, talking about RSLs, MRSLs, and things of that nature um, throughout our entire supply chain. So that's from the design point to the delivery point to the consumer. Does that help? Yeah, that that's, um, that's great. And, and are there particular opportunities that you have identified through the work that you do that you know, our students could actually learn from or benefit from that you can share? Uh, the opportunities, I say, and this comes from both my work with Tommy, but also, you know, since I've only been with Tommy roughly about six to eight months, I'll call on some of my Disney backgrounds, so I'll throw on the ears. Uh, thinking about your product in terms of, so sustainability, a lot of people that I've worked with become paranoid sometimes when they hear the word sustainability because they're not familiar with the chemistry and they're not familiar with a lot of these scientific elements, right? They're, they're, uh, my, designer team, my design team at Disney would say, I'm a designer, I'm not the chemist. And I say, okay, well think about it in terms of efficiencies. Instead of saying sustainability, think about how you can be most efficient. And that would change the game for them. And that seems to be the thing that we're doing a lot at Tommy. It's how can we be more efficient with our packaging? How can we be more efficient with our, efficient with our dyeing process, processes? And so on and so forth. So I would encourage you that anytime you're looking at whatever the design is, think at that particular time because it's less costly to you. Right? It's less costly to your, your production facilities. And therefore, whatever your margin is might be greatly improved right? when, when it goes out to market. But also the strength in your business platform is greatly improved. Great, and, and I, actually you touched on something that I've, 
I've recognized in, in conversations with um, designers in the industry and also, um, you know, different people like you that are in, in various companies. Um, because I, I've noticed that um, as, we, as we move towards transforming the industry, designers, not just fashion designers, all kinds of designers, need to work with, with people with the kind of expertise that, for example, you have, and also chemists, and also um, different kinds of stakeholders um, in NGOs and so forth, that we didn't necessarily have to work with before. Um, so that's perhaps one of the shifts that's happening, is, is new kinds of collaborations and, and new kinds of um, sharings of expertise that I think are emerging. So. Absolutely. Great. So, um, Liz, um, your specialization is um, locally sourced natural dyes. And you might actually want to say a little bit about what that means, because I kind of skipped over it at the start. There might be quite a few people that don't know what that means. Um, what opportunities through your work with, with the dogwood dye, what opportunities do you see for the New York industry in that area? Yeah, so um, as a natural dyer, I am working with an, um, only plants and some minerals. Um, and uh, in comparison to chemical dyes, um, by the way, both processes use quite a bit of water, um, but uh, with no chemicals, you can be quite certain that um, you understand exactly what's in your dye and what is the source of the color um, on your clothing. And so there's quite a bit of transparency there, understanding that there's usually only a few ingredients per um, color. Uh, when working with only natural materials. And uh, I forage locally, uh, I go outside of the city and pick only what's abundant, uh, things that uh, either are invasive, um, and when they are abundant, I'm picking, you know, I, I usually try to keep 20% of, of what's in a stand. Um, I'll leave the rest for, um, for the wildlife there. But uh, I also grow locally. So um, in an urban environment, you, as you could imagine, if any of you are gardeners, um, that it is quite difficult to find place, uh, a place to grow in the city. Um, so my partner and I, who is a landscape designer, have built um, urban planters on the street sides, uh, on the sidewalks, um, where tree pits um, can contain actually quite a bit of growing space. Um, we just build a, a planter that protects the space, um, and it's uh, it's beneficial for the trees, um, helping to prevent the soil from compacting, um, creating biodiversity, um, and then it's also just a really clever way to um, to to grow dye plants. Um, you could grow edibles, but you'd actually have to be concerned about soil testing and um, contaminants. But with dye plants, you actually don't have to worry about that. Um, so it's it's a nice place. Um, I could I could very easily grow very easily grow in a um, my local. Um, community garden, but growing along the street side is just um, adds to the beautification of the city, um, as well as um, education about what c plants can actually produce. Um, so, um, for New York City, the opportunities, um, specifically in fashion, include, um, you know, creating a local economy. So, I am one of a few people in the city that actually do use natural dyes for production for fashion. Um, and so there's quite a bit of um, economic opportunity there. Um, and then opportunity, I think one of the biggest opportunities that I have is in educating and about slowness um, and the process um, kind of slowing down um, how, or, you know, I can only work so quickly. I can only work with what is given to me from nature. Um, and so I work seasonally, um, and I'm limited in uh, my color palette depending upon uh, what I'm picking. And so kind of educating the designer as well as the consumer about um, uh, color provenance um, restrictions, but the, framing that positively so that it's not um, a drawback or a negative. Um, and I think, you know, like I just said, there's opportunities to grow um, in the city and um, on rooftops to actually add to the, the greening of the environment in, in, an, in an urban environment, so, yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, Pascal, um, now over time your work has occurred um, in what I would call the fashion mainstream as well as what we could probably call alternative fashion spaces. Um, and actually I'd like, to, um, like you to elaborate on a little bit from my introduction, you know, what it is that you've actually been doing, uh, particularly in the last few years. And um, out of the work that you have been doing um, most recently, what is something that you've learned that you wish every fashion student 
um, new? So I have um, competed on the international fashion stage, let's say. I started as a young designer with a group of young designers doing fashion shows in Paris. I am from Holland and um, Holland didn't have an international fashion culture at all. So we were the first designers to do that. So I functioned in that system for several years. And I was, it was a challenging space at, uh, at one point for sure as a young designer. But I also kind of was in a competitive space that didn't serve me. And around my 30th birthday, I had to make a substantial change because I was living in this competitive space in a quite an isolated environment. And I wanted to work towards a more cooperative type of, of engagement with the people around me and with the world. Up till, up till this day, because I'm educated in a very traditional fashion education, similar to Parsons fashion here, I would say. Up till this day, I am still not able to collaborate with my best friend because we're kind of conditioned in a very competitive mindset. So we're both educated to be, in that time, I graduated in 92, we're both educated to be this one big new fashion designer on the stage of fashion internationally. And we still have that, we still carry that competitiveness in our relationship because I've also been living outside of the country for almost 10 years now. So when we go back to each other, we go back into that mindset. So I've been kind of reconditioning myself in a way to work in a more cooperative way and to learn to cooperate um, in a deep way. So not in, because I've been conditioned within a competitive system and I see that in this world, competition is basically what is breaking down the system or the systems around us because it makes us compete to do more, to be more famous, to be more, to produce more than others are producing. So for me, competition is at the moment, I think, at the core of what's not work, working in, 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 our, um, in relation to building a sustainable world. So that's something I'm really concerned with. Uh, I've been doing since, since I did a postgraduate in fine arts and theory because I needed a broader kind of perspective to understand what I was doing and what I was working in. And since then, I've been doing mostly collaborative projects, and I've purposefully designed them to become, yeah, a cooperator, let's say, basically. And f at the moment, I'm really interested in establishing a worker cooperative. That's something that's still very foreign to fashion. And a worker cooperative means that all the people who are working in the cooperative also own uh, the business. But it also means that we're all equal. Because I think another challenge in our system, fashion especially, is that the fashion designer is still celebrated as the highest level of success within our school. In the world, it's uh, Mr. Arnaud, who's kind of getting most out of the, uh, out of the business. But so there's a big, yeah. I'll say one more thing. For us to have social justice and kind of earth justice, we need economic justice. Thank you very much. You actually um, beautifully preached into my next question, which I'm going to open to each of the three of you. And in some, in some ways, you, Pascal, actually just spoke to it. But um, um, what do you see as the main challenges facing fashion? And... Um, and how would you look at those as opportunities? Um, because I, I, you know, being a fashion designer and and approaching my work always from the point of view of problem solving, um, I find it quite easy usually to frame a challenge as an opportunity. Um, it's just a, it's a shift in the context in which the challenge occurs that it becomes an opportunity. But um. um because each of you work in fairly different spaces, and, and I'd love to hear from each of you, um, and I'll start with you, Nicole. What, what do you see as the main challenges facing fashion? So a lot of the time, that I, what I'm hearing are alternatives to what's consistently been available in the market, right? That we've consistently worked with cottons, that we've consistently worked with um, 
cardboard that we've consistently worked with a particular type of wool. The, the challenge is what are the alternative, or the question is what are the alternatives, right? So the opportunity is in trying to identify those. And then introducing it into the marketplace if it doesn't already exist, or finding the brilliant mind out there who may be sitting in the audience or something like that that created this, this particular material or a resolution. So it's one trying to find, I think for me, it's going to be trying to find that balance between stating what our issue and our concerns are without giving up the farm, if you will. Like saying, hey, you know, our backs are up against the wall. We're, we're not in a good, good spice. We need an answer. Really it's, hey, in the future, we see that we're going to be looking for something. And it's not necessarily organic cotton. It's not necessarily a conventional cotton. What is that? And then asking, you know, society as a whole, what, what are some solutions? What do you see on, is it BCI? Is it, you know, are there alternatives? And then hopefully someone out there is like, well, wait a minute, why don't you just do blah, blah, blah? So it's trying to find and advertise um, the need without putting yourself, and I think a lot of brands find themselves, they may not be ready to divulge everything that they're facing because of this, this kind of, well, you don't know what you're doing. Or, or this backlash, and it's really, no, I'm just trying to encourage the next wave of folks, because it used to be that polyester was going to do everything, right? <laughs> polyester at one time was king, right? And then people were like, oh, no, not that. So what is that next thing and in all aspects of the business? So it doesn't necessarily mean if you are the designer, it's I'm looking for the next engineer. I'm looking for the next PR. I'm looking for the next marketing. It's in all aspects, the next supply chain genius out there. So that, that's where it opens up the door to everyone. That's what I see. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go back to you, Pascal. I mean, even though you just kind of spoke to it, but um, maybe perhaps speak into... Um, I'm going to take it a bit more specific with you, given what you said before. Um, in terms of the opportunities, what opportunities do you see for collaboration in fashion education? Um, and I'll actually put some context into it. Um, just on a very pre preliminary level, um, Liz and I have been talking about developing a course where the students, the students in the course, they are actually a design team. So even though they are working individually, they're actually working towards one shared goal and and the idea with this course is that when it finishes, you know, there's, uh, there's not one garment that can be tied back to one designer in the class. But, um, but what, might, what, what might you see as some of the opportunities for fashion design education? Well, I think what, um, with the fashion uh, area of study in the integrated design program, what I think we've been doing is to connect each student what they're really passionate about. So it's kind of letting go of this idea that we're not educating them for a specific position in the industry or for the industry at all. I think I'm quite proud that in IDP there's not this kind of... I think students in a fashion education have this idea of the fashion world already in front of them. There's fixed values, there's fixed notions of success. And if they don't reach those terms of success, they see themselves as a failure. And they're regarded as a failure in many fashion educations because they're not the most fashionable of the class, or I don't know what the values are. And I think in, in IDP, what we've been trying to do is to really connect students to their own potential and to their own desire, which creates enormous diversity because people discover things about themselves that they didn't even know. Students will come in and they think they're going to be a fashion designer and they go out and are a performer, for instance. And that diversity creates natural kind of cooperation because all of a sudden, this performer who doesn't feel any competition from the person who is interested in, in costume design can collaborate very naturally and very organically. So it's not a collaboration that... So I think that's the thing with collaboration. I think it needs to happen from an internal kind of affinity with other people. It cannot be something that is, is kind of external, but it needs to happen from a kind of natural synergy. 
so that there's joy and that there is kind of, it's almost like being in love. If some if a collaboration works well, it's like being in love, you know. And it and whatever you produce is kind of your child together, you know. It's kind of, for me, it has always worked like that. And that's for me the joy of being in this world and kind of being surrounded by people who are so diverse and so different that I'm really inspired by them. So for me, it's it's based on inspiration and kind of mutuality and 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 yes, those types of things. Right. So, listen, I should make sure that we're not working towards a course based on divorce. <laughs> um, so, Liz, what about you? What do you see as some of the challenges and also opportunities? Um, yeah, I really like that you frame the question that way. Um, because to me, personally, that's what I really like about working within sustainable fashion world is that there are limitations that I'm facing. I can't use any material out there. I'm you know, focused, especially as a natural dyer, I can only use natural materials. Um, and for me, that is actually, um, has more of a creative genesis. Um, and so um, I really think that framing the, um, what oftentimes are framed as um, obstacles, actually as opportunities, um, I mean, looking at the way that um, that generally the fashion world is very competitive. And um, I always, I like to speak to my students and, and, and remind them that, you know, you can find a much more collaborative um, environment in the sustainable fashion world. Um, and, you know, one of the biggest challenges that fashion faces is massive and flagrant consumption. And so they, there needs to be, um, there are opportunities in um, sort of turning that on its, on its tail and um, being innovative in business models and practices. So collaborative consumption, for instance, um, so that you can still be, be profitable um, in fashion without, uh, and focus on quality versus uh, quantity. Um, and, I think, in general, it'll just be um, one of that's for me. I think one of the biggest challenges that the fashion the fashion designers face now is how to create uh, quality and um, and continue to be creative without um, depleting resources and um, doing things in in, in new, uh, particularly on the business side. Great, thank you very much, and. Um, I'm going to jump back to you, Nicole, because something you said um, before, um, it, it resonated with, with a question that comes up to me. A lot of students at the end of every academic year, um, particularly students who are graduating, they um, come to me and, and ask me, like, what are, the, what are the sustainable brands out there that I can work for? These are students who haven't, have a deep care about sustainability already. And... Um, and what you actually said kind of reminds me of, of the kind of response that I try and give these give those students is is uh, my advice is to actually just go out there and and be the difference that you want to see in the industry um, because it's not not like there needs to be this sustainable fashion industry and then the fashion industry it, there's the fashion industry um, and um, and I have had students go into um, all kinds of companies and, and start to make the change. And, and of course, when you're you know, in your first year in the professional world as an assistant designer, you, know, you don't necessarily have a huge amount of say, but nonetheless, you know, we all do have a say. And, um, and so, um, how, what's, what's advice that you can give to students, uh, whether they're fashion students or, and because I'm presuming that there's not just fashion students here today, um, but those students who have an interest in sustainability and, and, um, and you know, when they enter the workforce, um, how, can they, what's, how can they make a difference in, in the roles that they have? And I know it's a very, very broad question and it's also a very company-specific question as well. But, um, but you know, speak from your perspective at Tommy. Um, I would advise learn the company. Learn the business because at the end of the day, that's the only way that you will know if change is one possible and then what changes you've been able to influence and or make happen. So it does you no good to go into an organization and say, I'm going to make sure that we have no paper. And you work for, you know, 
Hoffman Mifflin who produces, you know, paper, math books or something like that, right? You have to learn the business and know what the bottom lines are, know what those, those key and critical elements are. So I can't come to Tommy and say, you know, all of our garments need to be 100% sustainable because that would mean we're going to shut everything down, right? <clears throat> I'm going to say, hey, I think that we can improve, you know, talk to me about your shipping, talk to me about this particular garment. What is it? What's the hand? What's on? Well, and then by that, I'm learning the business. So that way, as I find those alternatives, or I say, hey, I found some other facilities who might have a better perspective. I could say, maybe we can use some natural dyes. I can introduce that because now I know what they're talking about. And I'm coming to the table cognizant of the fact that they are the masters of that particular craft. I'm not taking it for granted because I read something in a magazine somewhere that it's going to mean something to our company. And you start learning and you start influencing. And now you have long-term sustained change. They're going to think about that the next time they do that same exact sweater. They're going to think about that the next time they want to air freight something versus finding the time to, to put it on a ship, if that's the case. So no matter what your particular forte is, learning whatever the business is of the company that you go to work for is critical and paramount, and it doesn't matter. That, that's across the board. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, Pascal, um, you've speak, spoken to a little bit into this already, but um, um, if you... If you look at the, and you mentioned that the education that you received was in many ways um, not unlike the one that we we deliver here at Parsons, and I would certainly say that my my education was very similar to the one that as well that we deliver here at Parsons. But now, when we look at the the things that you do, and and um, and also what Liz does and I do, um, there are some significant shifts that have happened in in that time in in fashion education and. And um, if there's, let's say, three things that you want um, students to take away from here today, uh, what would those three things be? Ah, that's a challenging one. <laughs> I know. And it, <laughs> they're not the only three things you should take away. But <laughs> well, I think uh, what is really important, so as I said before, I think it's really important that we introduce other values and other notions of success into the work that we do and in the society that we live in. So that not only this one designer is, is, is kind of the, the image of success that we all need to strive for. I think it's really important to connect to our own well-being, understand and uh, kind of be inspired by people who do things that you feel is really um, touching you and kind of connect to those people. I think we have to create networks of like-minded people and do see, I know we've been conditioned to be competitors and I know it's a tough one, but I think as long as we can start to create networks in which we can start to support each other instead of kind of fighting each other, that would be amazing, I think. so. The more we can collaborate, and I think the class, you and uh, Liz, are, that sounds amazing, I think. So I would definitely uh, want to be in a class like that. I think the more opportunities we can create where collaboration is, is our notion of success and where seeing and valuing each other is our notion of success and also celebrating what we bring to, to, that, to those collaborations constantly and seeing ourselves as a success, I think would be an amazing, uh, an amazing contribution to where we as a society can contribute to a more healthy future for all of us. Great. I think both Nicole and, and Pascal, you both actually speak to what I would also describe as listening, like being, having, having the space and openness to be able to listen to people, what, what people actually really care about um, in, um, in whatever work that they do. Um, and actually, I think one of the underlying things that's coming through for me is, is we talk about collaboration um, like it's a new, sometimes we talk about it like it's a new thing in fashion, but when you actually look at how companies operate, um, you look at a, like a supply chain is, is a perfect example of collaboration, I think. Um, but there's, 
some of the power relationships perhaps sometimes, you know, I think Rana Plaza um, is one example of where, you know, there, there's a definite negative impact on, on some of the stakeholders within the supply chain, but nonetheless, um, collaboration is an inherent part of fashion and always has been in, in many ways. But I think the challenge is, Timo, is that that's true. I mean, nothing happens on this earth without collaboration and without inter interdependency and interconnectedness. But the, the challenge is that in our educations, we don't value those things. So someone who wants to be a pattern maker is still kind of seen less important or less exciting than someone who wants to be a fashion designer in, the, in a course or in a traditional fashion education. And without a pattern maker, there's not going to be any clothes. So, and, and a dyer, I imagine as well, if you in, in a high profile fashion education claim you're going to be a natural dyer, it's not something that most people who come to that type of education imagine first. So I think it's really exciting that those that that now that there is this possibility that we have this beautiful panel here and that those things are celebrated and that this is that it, this is success that we're here. And just to speak to your point, I mean that is a fairly recent shift. Um, but even even last year, I know a number of students who graduated from the BFA Fashion Design Program who made it very clear at the start of their senior year that they wanted to be pattern makers. And we really embraced that because, I mean, that's, you know, as educators, we've recognized that we're here for the students. And if that's what somebody is passionate about and wants to do, then, you know, we do everything to support them in that goal. And, um, and like you said, it's a very noble one because there wouldn't be, those of you who are fashion students would know that without the pattern there is, <laughs> there is this problems. <laughs> and, um, 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 Liz, um, I, I'm actually going to um, just start to shift to the, to the final questions to, to each of the panelists. But, um, um, you know, today is Earth Day and also then in two days from now we have Fashion Revolution Day. And Fashion Revolution Day um, in, in case there are people who don't know, is um, the second anniversary of Rana Plaza, which was a, a, a collapse of a factory complex in Bangladesh in which about 1,100 people died. And, um, and Fashion Revolution Day is, uh, was set up last year to commemorate the tragedy and also to really empower all of us to actually start to stay, take a stand and, and, um, and, and be a difference in the world. Um, so Liz... What would be something that anybody in this room that you see could, could you know, an action that anybody in, in here could take to mark Earth Day, whether it's in their everyday life at home or, or in their studies or in their work? Yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned uh, Fashion Revolution Day. I've spoken about it with my students, but I guess um, something that's very approachable and easy for anyone, I mean, I feel like everyone is um, somewhat... Um, um, active in social media or, you know, social, um, even if it has nothing to do with technology, but just to, to commemorate Fashion Revolution Day and ramp up to it, um, not only on the day um, that commem commemorates that, um, or that is the anniversary of this disaster, but um, to call out to v either using social media or um, in your physicality and the way that you dress um, this week um, and specifically on Friday. And um, the, the call out is to actually wear your clothing with your tag visible, whether that means in, inside out. Um, and then uh, you can use social media to hashtag it with uh, where, where are my clothes made or fashion revolution, um, which really will just help raise awareness to um, specific companies to just sort of um, call for transparency so there is an understanding of um, ethical business practices. Um, but that's sort of something that's very easy and simple to do. Um, and maybe even just take a, a personal, real quick inventory of your own clothing to see if you could determine um, where your, most of your clothing is made. Just a quick glimpse into any, any of our closets. You probably get a, a real quick understanding as to um, the, the global impact that the fashion industry does have. Thank you. I also recommend counting your clothes at least um, once a year. Uh, it's very eye-opening. <laughs> um, 
Thank you, thank you, Liz. Uh, Pascal, what would you say, to, just to um, um, refocus on Earth Day, um, what's something that you see that anybody in here could, you know, one action that anybody here could take today to mark, to mark Earth Day? Um, well, in relation to Fashion Revolution Day, there will be, uh, uh, there will be posters and places in the school where you can have your photo be taken as well, uh, which is sponsored by SDS and the new alternative fashion minor in the School of Design Strategies. The alternative fashion minor will look a bit more critically at the whole system of fashion and see where maybe there are opportunities for um, in, in, in relation to, in conjunction with the fashion program as well. Um, and for the rest, I would say uh, maybe for today, kind of um, express your appreciation for someone who's very special to you in your life. Thank you. And Nicole, um, um, what would you offer uh, fashion consumers? We, uh, before we started, um, I said to Nicole, you know, everybody in here will be a consumer of fashion and, and we can speak to that. And she said, well, let's hope so. I said, and I said, yeah, let's really hope that everybody does come dressed. Uh, at the new school, you don't always know beforehand. Um, so thank you for all coming here clothed. Um, so what would you offer uh, everybody here as one, one thing that they can do to mark Earth Day today? Uh, they took all the great answers, right? But um, so I'll give you a homework assignment. Why not? We're at school, right? Um, do a carbon catalog of your own activities. Why not? You know, you can use tools. I think you can find it on the US EPA website. There are several others. If you just Google a personal carbon calculator and you just plug in some information about yourself and you can see your consumption or your, your contribution to greenhouse gases. Uh, had to do it for an assignment and it was quite eye-opening because at the time I have a house in Florida and I'm driving about my way. I'm like, ooh, mm -hmm, maybe I should pick up some friends along the way and take them where they need to go or see who wants to come with me or how can I reduce this? It, but it just gives you some, pers some perspective and then encourage your friends and try to figure out, okay, if I'm doing this and my habits are pretty similar to the habits of a lot of my friends, hmm, what does this mean? And then most of the time in the calculators, it'll show you the differences, like of a similar age person living in a different part of the world. And then you can see, you know, unfortunately, USA consumption versus uh, France, versus Nigeria, versus, you know, somewhere else in the world. And what is it? You always hear about the consumption of water, how many earths it would take, how many earths it would take just to sustain us. But that's something that you can keep in your mind throughout the year. So as you're doing these other activities, you might flash back and say, oh, I'm going to do the double-sided print. Oh, oh, I'm going to definitely not take the Uber. Uh, I'm a fan of Uber, but I, I'm going to take the Uber. I'm going to cab it, or I'm going to walk it, and this is what this means. Or I'm going to go to my farmer's market. And now maybe I have a couple of questions for that farmer about their practices or something like that. It's very interesting how quickly you can become annoying <laughs> with those questions. You know, my father used to say, good gosh, can you stop reading? Because I would ask him all of these questions, right? But it's very interesting. You just naturally, you just start thinking about things in a different way. It starts expanding your perspective. So I would encourage, that would be my one tip for the day. Can I say something quickly? I, I'm glad that you mentioned the carbon calculator because there is a water calculator as well. I think it's called waterfootprint.org. Um, and it's very quick. It takes five minutes for you to just plug in the sorts of things that you eat and your water use in the home and outside of the home. And because what I do depends so much on water. Um, and, um, it, you know, just to bring up the point that water, not just in the production of your clothing, but also in the washing and care for your clothing. Because I think also when you do that mini inventory into your clothing, you can quickly understand um, how much of your clothing is washed uh, or is d needs to be washed um, after every use. Um, so that's something that I really like about my practice and um, sort of my commitment to natural dyes is that I am limited to working with um, animal fibers um, and natural fibers that 
require um, natural fi or animal fibers requiring much less washing than um, cotton, for instance. Although I do use cotton, um, but I like that there is a greater affinity of the for of the color towards an animal fiber um, because then um, I'm also encouraging um, consumption to be um, to be focused on products that require less wash. I think um, most people would be surprised to under to, to to learn that um, washing and care is um, is the bulk of the environmental and the water um, impact that garments actually have. It's not just in the production, but the actual, um, all the tumble drying and washing that we do of our clothing, uh, especially in the, the Western world, mm -hmm. so. Great, thank you. And, and if, I, if I dare attempt summing up what all three of you, um, you know, are, are telling the audience that you can actually do is, is um, on one hand, um, to start to develop a, a kind of a literacy of your, like the ecological literacy of, of your own life or, you know, and in, inside of that, like a water impact literacy and, and, um, and a carbon literacy as well. Like under, the, the un, having an understanding of, of the kinds of impacts that, you know, our everyday lives have. Um, I, I certainly think that we are in a moment in time where there's a real paradigm shift happening where those kind of understandings, they are becoming a requirement for just being an everyday good citizen. Um, and let alone in, in fields where we are actually, you know, creating products and, and creating systems. Um, moving forward, those are, you know, within the minimum requirements. And, and also then to um, bring Pascal's point into it, also just have, have a, an an openness for collaboration and also an appreciation of, of the people around you. Um, so that's how I would sum up the, the, the beautiful things that all three of you um, um, shared. So with that, I actually would like to open, open things up for the audience to, to have questions. Uh, do we have microphones for the audience? Great. Question if no one else has, so I can start it off. Right. <laughs> um, so this is for uh, Nicole. Yes. So working for a large organization that um, has is not founded on sustainable. Uh, you know, their core mission is not about doing no harm. How do you how do you have how do you feel you can have the greatest impact to make a shift uh, within the organization? towards more sustainable practices. And how, um, my other interest is in how important do you think it is to the consumer that your product is sustainable? Okay, so I'm gonna make sure I cover, but I'm gonna answer the second question sure. first. yeah. Okay, about the consumer. I think it's exceptionally important to consumers depending on the market. But the perception that we have is that it's important to all. They may just not know it yet. Right? It's important to all of us. What I put on my back is important to the two of them. It might not directly Im impact them, but it, but it does have an impact on their quality of life. Right? So I think that at Tommy, <clears throat> where it might not have been founded and written into the original development of the, of the company, right? it is absolutely a core value of Tommy Hilfiger that we be great and, and the best of corporate citizens. And, and what we do and how we treat one another, how we treat those who make our brand and our mission and our, and our position in the world possible, that they all those things need to be considered. It is absolutely vital. So the way that it happens is adoption at the very top and at, throughout the company. So that there is no one individual that it is not top of mind that we appreciate that you are putting your faith in us when you buy a pair of our jeans. And we want you to walk away and, and know that we have done everything that we can and we are gonna to continue to push that envelope to make this the best product possible. And I don't think that, I, I think that that would be the statement throughout the company. Uh, one of the things I think it's concerned, it's really great when 
CEOs or someone says something, right? But they are not the ones processing the purchase orders. It, they're not the ones doing the, the design concept all the time, right? They are not the ones taking the time to look at all the different color swatches. So you really have to do from the inside out, right? Not the top down. It has to go, and you have to have those real heart-to-heart -heart conversations to say, this is not the best thing. Let me show you all these chemicals. <clears throat> Let's have a conversation about what's going on in the marketplace and building that kind of value system or reinforcing, because I'll tell you what, the minute that I came on board, I got tons of emails from folks within the company. Oh, I've been wanting to talk to someone about blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, that's great. Let's talk about it. Let's do this. Well, what's keeping you from doing it? I did. I snuck and did it anyway. Or something, you know, and, and you start hearing now more about the stories. I think people have been doing it, and we just haven't been giving a lot of the brands and a lot of the folks inside the brands the credit for doing great things. So hopefully did that answer, did I help? Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good day. Um, it's, I don't know if it's a, it's, it's more like a futuristic question. Um, you've spoken about economic justice, about paradigm shifts that may be happening. And I'm just curious to know, um, I'm from Colombia, right? And just to give you an example, we have stores uh, like sweater stores called Chetland and you know different kind of stores. And uh, the clothing stores, what they do is like they're unique products. That means like you don't have a massive production of like more than 200 sweaters. No, they're just unique. They're the it's the quality. And I I'm wondering if you know students here at the new school or you know other. Um, you know, uh, fashion designers, pattern makers, are going to be entering into the future where they think more in a collaborative sense of quality. And if that's going to be a huge, I guess, competition to the, you know, the brand name companies out there, but knowing that um, their natural dyes or their quality, their, so I'm, I'm wondering if that's going to happen later on in the future here in New York City. Yeah, I think it just goes back to um, to what we've come accustomed to in the last 20 or so years um, in the United States, which is cheap clothing. <laughs> so um, we, I mean, it's probably, it's multi-layered. You're dealing with a social structure where people sometimes shop to stress relief. <laughs> and so there's just, you know, more supply to meet the demand. So shopping has become um, an activity um, uh, where you're not just looking for quality garments, but you're looking to just consume. Um, so that's perhaps one of the reasons why the supply and the consumption has ramped up. Um, and so we're, we've come up, become accustomed and we feel entitled as, as consumers to inexpensive clothing because it's been um, getting cheaper and cheaper. And so quality goes down as a result, um, as does uniqueness. Um, and so when things are, are mass produced. So I think um, values really, um, value change will really contribute to that um, if we go uh, back to uh, less and um, focus more on quality. Um, and um, I think that's probably one of the biggest contributors to, um, to the consumption issue. Uh, first, a general question. As we think about resources and conservation of resources, like water, electricity, uh, cardboard, fibers, uh, have, have you thought about time as one of the, the mates of, of this? In other words, one of the resources that you think about as you think about being uh, uh, conservation-minded. So that's a general question. Then specifically for Liz, have, you, have there been any colors that you have not been able to achieve by the natural process? I can answer the color for question first. Um, there are many colors, I think, that um, are, well, black being one, for instance, which is um, just a, a staple of the fashion industry. Um, and it's probably one of the most impossible colors, not impossible, it is possible. Um, 
What, what's that? Orange instead, yeah, orange is the new black, yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I mean, I think it's just, again, it's about a reevaluation of, um, of color and what, um, so, but yeah, I think that there are a lot of, uh, in the spectrum of colors, there are many colors that you really can't achieve with natural dyes, um, but uh, there are also many colors that natural dyes give that chemical dyes could never even compare to. Um, it, has, it has to do with the way that it's, um, the color sits on the cloth um, and the way that molecularly um, natural dyes are coming from a living source. And so um, every molecule is a different size and especially with something like indigo, which produces a blue, um, the, co the color is layered on the cloth over many dips into uh, the dye vat. So you've got this complexity and richness and beauty um, and I call it a living color just because it does has a has a resonance and a vibrance that's so, so much different than a, a flat chemical color. Um, and then your first question again, I'm sorry. Time, yes. I mean, I my process is slow, um, and I'm working with fashion designers that usually want everything yesterday. So I, um, it's for me, it's about an education to my clients that if they want a certain color, you know foraged locally, um, they're going to have to plan a little bit further in advance and work with a slower process and um, understand that it's, the color is much more beautiful and vibrant and gratifying because it's slow. Um, and so time is um, valuable, but I think more so because of the process is so much more um, enriching. Um, and that's how I feel. I value and um, pay a reverence to time in my practice. So this question kind of relates to some of the, the um, you know, the other conversation that you're having um, uh, about time and, and about diversity of production, which I think the question up there is sort of pointed to. Um, and I guess, Nicole, this is a question um, for you maybe, like um, in order to, for, more cor larger brands, corporate brands, to be more sustainable, um, you know, you really have to sort of address this issue of scalability. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, particularly if you if you're going to think about social, uh, you know, being um, ethical socially, you know, as as you produce. So, um, I guess, for, like for me, I'm I'm also involved in natural dyeing and and. Um, localized production of textiles. And um, I've been in conversation with some larger brands about how to start integrating some of these alternative methods into their, um, into their uh, businesses. Um, and like issues have come up, for example, with natural dyeing, which is like a completely artisanal activity now, right? So how, <laughs> the question is, how do you scale something like that up? Um, the same thing if, you know, we're, tr we're trying to um, connect to uh, uh, local farmers for, for fiber products, um, there's an issue of, of scalability. So, so I mean, I, I guess the, the interesting aspect of, it, of this is that sustainability, I think, inherently leads to um, economic diversity, you know, um, because uh, if you're sourcing from a lot of different places rather than like centralizing, you know, production and sourcing, it seems that uh, inherently brands are going to have to realize that they're going to have to go to like multiple sources um, and, and like, you know, address um, not just uh, environmental impacts, but also um, socioeconomic impacts as well. Um, so I think this is a challenge for large corporations, and I'm posing this question, like, have you thought of this? Um, you know, what are the challenges? I mean, this is a huge question, but I think it's really important, and as a takeaway, I think this is something that everyone should sort of think about today, because we do deal with large brands. I mean, that's what the fashion industry consists of, right? Like, a, a big part of it. So how do we grapple with this? Okay, so if we can turn to page 168 of my PowerPoint now, um, that is a very great question um, or great concept to put out there for discussion, right? So scalability, yes, it's a challenge. Um, and that's going to vary between brand to brand because first you mentioned, uh, well, one of the points that you mentioned was in terms of uh, bigger brands having to go to multiple sources, right? 
versus a one-spot source. That depends on your one-spot source. That's a, that's a very big notion to have in your head that, oh, I'm, I'm going to diversify. I might not. If I have the best of suppliers in the world and they're doing the top notch, why would I diversify? So, right? So, there, so you'll have to figure out that sourcing program within that particular company. I come from a sourcing background. So when you said that, I'm like, why would I, why would I break up all my... <laughs> if I've only got to do one set of audits at a cost... See, now we're getting into some stuff, right? So if I only have to break up and I only have one set of audits or one place that I have to audit, isn't that more cost beneficial to me than spreading out my wealth amongst 20 or 30 different entities that I'm going to audit all 20 or 30, right? But depending on that particular commodity, that might be the best thing for me to go out to those 20 or 30s because I don't want any one location. Uh, something happened in Japan, I think, a couple years ago. It was the one location where this one particular piece for an electronics device was produced in the world. And they had the tsunami, and then it was, it was done. And everybody was waiting for a year plus to get this particular component. Not good. So diversity is great. Um, in terms of scalability, I think that a lot of the companies, a lot of the brands have already started thinking about that. The, 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 if I'm to understand you correctly, because I'm trying to put all the different, I'm like, what's your number? Should we have a conversation? That's what I'm thinking, right? Uh, <laughs> like, let's have coffee after this and talk about this issue, because this is real. Um, but I think that a lot of the brands already are thinking about that scalability. The, the challenge is, as you are introducing something to them, how you play into that scalability and how you add value into that in terms of what you know, where it can be made, what it, where, where your goods are best suited in terms of its manufacturing and, and so on and so forth. So that's, that, that's what you have to come to the table with. That's what you need to be thinking about as well. Because the brands, for the most part, they've been, we've been building and doing this thing for quite some time, right? And we've... in the way um, maybe corporations think, you know, and maybe, maybe it is about doing more audits or, you know, having, mm -hmm. spreading out, uh, you know, your sourcing so that there are more smaller businesses that are, um, that are um, benefiting economically, you know, and money's going back into communities, right, rather than being centralized into these uh, single locations. I mean, it's, this is just, you know, again, open for conversation and the same thing with, um, something else that you said, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, a, it's complex, I mean, it's, it is. it's not a simple solution, but it's definitely something. It is, that. and I think in the States you see that across a lot of other industries as well, right? So yes. you have where a lot of architectural engineering firms own the marketplace. How do you introduce a new smaller business into that marketplace? And it's, it's trying to find those paths. And there's no one way, there just isn't. I, I mean, I wish I knew that particular answer. I would sell it. And I'd be living a very carbon neutral uh, a lifestyle. But your point is, well, is very well made, absolutely, that that has to be something that's considered. But I think it's, it's so unique and it's so individualized. And you can't just throw a blink and say all corporations and brands need to do that because it's, it's not the case. And maybe it's not the case of that particular commodity or service either, right? So we'll get together and we'll have, we're going to have coffee afterwards. So yeah, yeah, there you go. I think two more, yeah. Hello. Okay. Hi. Um, so my question is directed towards anyone, I guess, but in the realm of sustainable materials and ethical materials, is there any material specifically that you think makes the most sense or is more sustainable than, than the other sustainable materials? If that, I don't know if I worded that right, but. Well, I'm limited, to, like I said, um, limited in a good way to working with only natural materials. And I try to can encourage my clients to only use 
organic cotton if you're going if they're going to use cotton. Um, less pesticides, usually less water involved. Um, and then I do strongly encourage to use animal fibers such as wool and alpaca and mohair and silk, which is an animal fiber, um, just because of the less um, energy and water used in their care. Um, and I feel that um, it also encouraging, encouraging biodiversity amongst um, animal and um, plant fibers. So um, hemp is a wonderful fiber, which also works with natural dyes, um, but it also has much less of an impact on the earth um, than cotton does traditionally. Hemp, unfortunately, you can't grow in the United States, but, um, and it also, we've, they've, um, technology has made great strides in the quality of hemp fiber, so it's not what you would imagine it was 15 years ago. Um, and it's much stronger than cotton, so I think all denim should be made. Um, you know, we're denimvores, we consume so much, um, now worldwide, of denim, it, it all should be hemp. Um, so those are some of my favorite materials as far as sustainability goes. Okay, so um, with Tommy, one of our 2020 commitments is 100% more sustainable cotton. You know, and the, and the question is going to be, what does more mean? Better than the stuff that we were using yesterday, right? And again, it goes back to the point made earlier, always pushing and trying to find out what's out there in the marketplace. So where there's an opportunity and, and an ability to use organic, yes. Now you're starting to see different collaborative organizations, uh, Better Cotton Initiative, um, Cotton Made in Africa. You're starting to see all of these other, where they go in and they do education or, or they have educational programs, um, helping the farmers know when they can use the best times to use pesticides so that they're using yes, less, right? And going in there and, and saying, okay, this is how we can use less irrigation, less water. And now you have a better yield in most cases and the farmer has a better lifestyle. So it goes to the economics, right, of the, of the community. But it's always pushing to see what that next thing is. How can this be improved? How do we know it? But it's also important to be able to document it. It's one thing to have something in theory that you have a more sustainable product or a more sustainable anything, but it's really in the documentation. Can I show you that the cotton that I used five, 10 years ago was this, we can, we can do that, right? And now I can show you that the cotton that I'm using now or, or how, what I'm sourcing from is better in the following ways and I can give you that data because we're gonna consume cotton. We're going to consume a lot of items, but did we do it in a more responsible way? So the more comes from that documentation. That's my thought. Um, so you've talked about quality being more important than quantity, but there are still some brands in mass market like, let's say, Zara and H&M, whose focus is obviously quantity rather than quality. And what do you think, um, since people right now are more interested in sustainability than ever before, will the attitude of these brands towards sustainability shift somehow in the nearest future? And if it will, how? Um, I don't think it can. And I think they're going to open up more and more markets. Um, China, Africa. So all these big companies will emerge more and more, I think, until <laughs> I hopefully there's a natural collapse or I don't know what will happen to it. <laughs> we'll see. Because <laughs> already I think I see it with bikes, with clothes, like new clothes, new bikes are cheaper than uh, reusing clothes, reusing. So even in the African market that gets shipped, all our no, no longer used clothes, H&M will be cheap at one point as well. So I think that's, the big, that's a big challenge, yes. If I can uh, say, so some of these brands, you mentioned H&M and what they are doing, and you should go visit their websites, right? And look again for that documentation or the information because some of the brands are absolutely in the game of becoming far more sustainable than they were the day before. 
the H&Ms, even the Walmarts here in the States, you know, I came from government, I have the government background, so Walmart was, whenever they came to the table, you're like, oh man, here comes Walmart. And now you're sitting there like, oh man, here comes Walmart. They changed, overnight, they are a company that changed the way they ship things. They have an impact throughout the world. The H and there are H and M programs. You know they do, and they report out great numbers and great information on how they are reducing their water consumption, even in the production of their their whether it's their goods or um, how they are shipping all of these things. They exist as as many brands and many companies, and as we do to make some type of profit. We don't want to all live in a in a in a debt situation. So that's not really the thing. But how are you? The question is really you know how are they doing that business? How, how are they managing it? Are they being ethical? Are they being responsible? Are they being proactive, not reactive? And I have to say that a lot of their work, um, I say kudos to them on, first of all, putting out their information that probably hurt at first when they said, hey, we have so many stores, and this is our greenhouse gas footprint, and this is up, 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 and down the list. And that, that stings, because that's coming to the table and saying, we've been bad, or, or we haven't been our best. Okay, and then 2013, 2014, 2016, here's our 2020 goal is to get to, I think they have a 100% sustainable cotton goal for 2020. I think they, and that's spread out over organic and a number of other, you know, BCI and other initiatives and things like that. They have water goals and they put all of this out there for public consumption that you can watch them and they update it regularly. So you can't just lump all brands into one particular bowl it really does take going out and looking at each one of them and then holding them to what they say that they're going to do and recognizing when they say, and we couldn't get it because of the following thing, but we keep working at it. I think there's uh, one more challenge that I think um, comes back to the question that you asked previously. That because, and that Liz uh, addressed earlier as well, those brands are not going to up their prices. They're still going to offer those garments for the prices they've been offering those garments to us. And what that does is that doesn't allow for a lot of diversity in the market because people are, and especially a younger generation, you guys, I'm still used to buying jeans for $100, $150. That's no option for you anymore. You buy a pair of jeans that's cheaper than a glass of wine you're going to drink in the evening. And that devaluation of clothing, clothing is still made by two hands. It's still made by people. The devaluation of clothing is a real challenge for the diversification of the market and for creating socioeconomic um, richness and diversity that could benefit uh, communities here locally in the US where, where it's also needed. There's poverty here, there's poverty all over the world. So if something needs to happen so that we start to value clothes again and value them so that we're able to pay $400 for a jacket again and not buy it for $40 at... So I think that's, for me, that's a big challenge, that the value, of, that we don't value clothes anymore as, as, as yeah, which it doesn't allow for a lot of diversity. So I don't know where that challenge is, is, will bring us. And with that, um, <laughs> with that very wide open question unanswered, um, I am actually going to thank um, Ted C for making today happen. And, um, and I ask all of you to join me in thanking Nicole, Pascal, and Liz for um, coming here today. And, and thank you so much for your generosity this morning. Thank you.